I want you to hit me as hard as you can. As fans eagerly await filmmaker Quentin Tarantino's 10th and supposedly final film, currently as mysterious as the contents of Marcellus Wallace's briefcase, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Reservoir Dogs marked the emergence of two pop culture phenomena, the kinetic filmmaker who would change the shape of indie cinema, and a movie that helped establish a new kind of cool. Let's go to work. And find out what the fuck happened to this movie. The story behind Reservoir Dogs all goes back to the video store, namely the now-closed Video Archives in Manhattan Beach, California, the shop where Quentin Tarantino famously worked for years. For a motormouthed encyclopedia of cinema knowledge who was raised on double features and TV, it was the best possible place to work. It was at Video Archives that Tarantino co-wrote My Best Friend's Birthday. Shot on black and white 16mm with a $5,000 budget, it clocked in at 70 minutes which technically makes it the first film from Quentin Tarantino. Although My Best Friend's Birthday is now partially lost, around half of it can be found online, it served as good practice for the budding director. So did the makeshift workshops at Video Archives, designed for the co-workers, including future Pulp Fiction co-writer Roger Avery, to pass around and critique each other's scripts. One of Tarantino's early efforts was titled True Romance, which began as a collaboration with Avery called The Open Road. Tarantino actually managed to sell the script, which would later be directed by Tony Scott, whose own Top Gun would be the target of a well-reasoned analysis on homoeroticism by Tarantino in the 1994 film Sleep With Me. It is a story about a man's struggle with his own homosexuality. Sold for $50,000, True Romance gave Tarantino some go-ahead money to try and get a more serious movie made. It would also help ensure that he wouldn't just end up playing Elvis impersonators or serving as a PA who cleans up dog shit on Venice Beach for a Dolph Lundgren workout video. Reservoir Dogs would be a heist movie that wouldn't show the heist, partly due to budgetary restrictions and partly as a move in creative energy. Written in just over three weeks, Reservoir Dogs revolved around a group of criminals, all strangers, hired for a diamond heist. Things immediately turned sour at the robbery, with the added tension that one of the men is an undercover cop. It would be told in a non-linear structure, which would become as much of a Tarantino staple as witty exchanges and women's feet. Inspirations for Reservoir Dogs came from all across the cinematic spectrum. The French New Wave was a huge influence, with Jean-Pierre Melville's gangster movies playing a part and Jean-Luc Godard being a stylistic idol. Tarantino even named his production company A Band Apart, after the French title for Godard's crime film Band of Outsiders. There was also Stanley Kubrick's early racetrack heist film, The Killing, and the film noir, Kansas City Confidential. His initial idea was to make a heist movie where the robbers all got away, out of his annoyance with crime films where minor quirks of fate would result in a bitter ending for the characters. But he clearly changed his mind over the course of putting the script on paper, judging by the ultimate bloodbath on screen. The idea of naming characters after colors was borrowed from 1974's The Taking of Pelham 123, which featured similar criminal codenames like Mr. Blue, Mr. Green, and yes, Mr. Brown. The stylish 1987 Hong Kong thriller City on Fire also seemed to share many elements, even drawing accusations of plagiarism. Reflecting on this type of criticism, Tarantino openly admitted, I steal from every single movie ever made. If my work has anything, it's that I'm taking this from this and that from that and mixing them together. The Reservoir Dogs script was riddled with crisp, quotable dialogue, complete with a hot take on Madonna's Like a Virgin. It hurts just like it did the first time. You see, the pain is reminding the fuck machine what it was once like to be a virgin. Hence, like a virgin. Which the singer would later rebuke, signing one of her albums to Tarantino, to Quentin, it's not about dick, it's about love. Oh, and about the movie's name. The inspirations for later Tarantino titles were generally without mystique, Pulp Fiction comes from pulp mags and crime paperbacks. Inglorious Bastards is a purposely misspelled take on a schlocky Enzo Castellari war movie. Kill Bill is an uncomplicated description of the bride's goal, and so on. But the title for Reservoir Dogs isn't quite as clear. The most popular origin theory is that a Video Archives customer had mangled the name of the French film Au Voir les Enfants. <laughs> but this is more or less considered lore. Tarantino himself said, it's just a perfect title for those guys. They are Reservoir Dogs, whatever the hell that means. With the script complete, Tarantino got it to producer Lawrence Bender, who slipped it to actor Harvey Keitel through an acting class Bender was taking. Keitel jumped on board, boosting the production budget significantly to one and a half million dollars and providing real legitimacy to the film. 
According to Tarantino, Keitel was so impressed with the script's apparent authenticity that he asked if the fledgling filmmaker had grown up in a bad neighborhood, or if he had family members connected with tough guys. Tarantino just shrugged and responded, I watch movies. Initially, Monty Hellman, director of acid western Ride the Whirlwind and road movie Two Lane Blacktop, wanted to direct. But this was Tarantino's baby. He had even confidently put written and directed by Quentin Tarantino on the script's cover page. And so, Hellman would serve as an executive producer. Now Tarantino just had to assemble the team of color-coded crooks. In addition to securing better finances, Keitel also played a huge role in the casting, even fronting his own money so Tarantino and Bender could hold casting sessions in New York, a location that would give them access to a broader variety of actors. Keitel would take the role of career criminal Mr. White himself. Mr. Pink would be Steve Buscemi, then on his way to becoming a Coen Brothers favorite. Tarantino actually wrote the part for himself, but he would later settle for Mr. Brown, despite its connotations. Yeah, but Mr. Brown, that's a little too close to Mr. Shit. Mr. Orange would be played by Tim Roth, who officially took interest after a drunken night out with the director. Rounding out the lawbreakers were Michael Madsen as malicious Mr. Blonde, and crime novelist and actual ex-convict Edward Bunker as Mr. Blue. There was also the established Chris Penn as Nice Guy Eddie, and Lawrence Tierney as gruff ringleader Joe Cabot nudging out character actor Timothy Carey, who had appeared in key inspiration, The Killing, and Robert Forster, who would later work with Tarantino on 1997's Jackie Brown. Other actors who auditioned or were pursued for roles included Vincent Gallo, James Woods, future Tarantino regular Samuel L. Jackson, musician Tom Waits, who called the script poetic, and George Clooney, who would soon join Tarantino in From Dusk Till Dawn. The cast had two weeks of rehearsal, which, according to Keitel, nearly went longer as Tarantino entertained the idea of doing it as a stage play. Production on the movie began in July 1991 and went 35 days. The primary location of the movie, an abandoned warehouse, was actually a mortuary, which seems appropriate considering just about every primary character is headed there by the movie's end. The upstairs of the building was repurposed into Mr. Orange's apartment. Those matching black suits, in addition to making everyone just look really cool, were based on the idea that actual robbers all dress alike so that witnesses have a harder time describing them as individuals to police. The production itself ran relatively smoothly, even though Tim Roth sometimes got unintentionally glued to the floor after spending hours under hot lights in a syrupy blood mixture. The British actor did also have challenges wrapping his mouth around an L.A. dialect. But the biggest thorny situation behind the scenes was actor Lawrence Tierney, known for being an ornery brute both on and off the set. Things got physical when Tierney, who Tarantino later described as a quote, crazy motherfucker, shoved the director in front of the cast and crew during an escalated confrontation. For that, Tarantino threw him off the set, only later making nice to finish the movie. Monty Hellman said that Tierney terrified everyone on the set and was a constant concern for potential lawsuits. Tierney also had difficulty remembering his lines, another source of frustration for both the actor and the director, who puts premium importance on his dialogue. As for the mystery surrounding the fate of Mr. Blue, Nobody's got a clue what happened to Mr. Blue? Eddie Bunker claimed that one final scene was planned, showing his demise, but the production ran out of money and it was never filmed. With shooting finished and editing essentially completed, his first with longtime editor Sally Menke, who passed in 2010, Tarantino engaged in what would be one of his most pivotal moments of creative control, centered around the movie's most iconic scene. Set to Steeler's wheels stuck in the middle with you, this scene features the sadistic Mr. Blonde doing an improvised dance around a bloody and bound police officer. Brandishing a straight razor, Mr. Blonde goes to town on the cop's ear, carving it off as the camera moves away, leaving much of the violence to the viewer's imagination, which tends to be a more corrupt place than the screen. The gruesome scene, an early gag by effects maestro Greg Nicotero, has been compared to the unsettling Singin' in the Rain assault from Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. It was also the subject of much discussion and debate between the filmmaker and Miramax. Producer Harvey Weinstein was primarily concerned about the audience, stating, I was afraid it would turn women off. Always a gentleman, that Harvey. Tarantino insisted it remain, and unlike so many before and after, he eventually won the editing battle against Weinstein. It's still one of the most controversial scenes in movie history. Tarantino stated, for some people, the violence or the rudeness of the language is a mountain they can't climb. That's okay, it's not their cup of tea, but I am affecting them. I wanted that scene to be disturbing and disturbing it was to the point that horror director Wes Craven walked out during a film festival screening, utterly shocked by the sequence. The movie's soundtrack, presented as part of K. Billy's Super Sounds of the 70s radio show, would be the beginning of Tarantino's perfect incorporation of songs both familiar and obscure in his movies. 
He wanted more incongruous music, which he described as the super sugary 70s bubblegum sound he grew up with. It certainly worked. The Mr. Blonde torture scene would not be nearly as disturbing without Jerry Rafferty and Joe Egan's harmless, and now infamous, pop song in the background. The real breakthrough for Reservoir Dogs came at Sundance in 1992. Even though it was his first feature, Tarantino had already established a reputation and a genuine buzz within the community, having taken workshops there the previous year when he had the script with him and even had Steve Buscemi perform scenes in front of Monty Hellman and Terry Gilliam, who was given a special thanks in the credits. Along with In the Soup's Alexandre Rockwell and Gas Food Lodging's Allison Anders, Tarantino was part of what came to be known as the Sundance Class of 92. It was Reservoir Dogs that had Park City foaming at the mouth, despite a premiere in which the film wasn't projected properly and suffered a power outage during the screening. Reservoir Dogs rocked the festival and marked a true change in the sorts of films that would get accepted. Author and historian Peter Biskin noted that characters rarely died in Sundance films, lest of AIDS, old age, or boredom. Even Robert Redford, who nurtured the festival, didn't want a slew of violent movies. Reservoir Dogs, as Tarantino put it, was no, quote, merchant ivory shit, referring to stuffy period pieces like A Room with a View and Howard's End. The director and his debut, bridging genre movies and art house films, kicked down the door and held a blade to its ear. Reservoir Dogs would later play at the Toronto International Film Festival, where it won the International Critics Award, and the Cannes Film Festival, where Tarantino would soon win the Palme d'Or with his follow-up Pulp Fiction. Distributed by Miramax, Reservoir Dogs opened in New York in October 1992, but made less than $3 million domestically. It was definitely not universally praised by critics at the time, with assessments like, this movie isn't really about anything, and the only thing Tarantino spells out is the violence. But it would go on to become a VHS phenomenon, which seems fitting since its origins are at video archives. Reservoir Dogs marked not just the emergence of one of cinema's most unique and visionary filmmakers, but also propelled a resurgence in the independent film movement. Empire Magazine would call it the greatest independent film ever made, edging out classics like George Romero's Night of the Living Dead and Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets. It may have started as a small labor of love by a hyperactive video store kid, but its immediate influence rapidly spawned countless copycats filling those same store shelves, each desperate to mimic his black comedy, fractured chronology, articulate sociopaths, and jolts of violence. As Tarantino phrased it, I became an adjective sooner than I thought I was going to. The movie has been widely revisited in many formats since its release, from action figures to video games to Suicide Girls burlesque. A young Michael Fassbender produced a stage version even though the film itself was banned in Ireland at the time. Twenty years after the film's release, director Jason Reitman staged a live reading with an all-black cast that included Lawrence Fishburne, Anthony Mackie, Anthony Anderson, Terrence Howard, and Cuba Gooding Jr. Among his dozens of unrealized projects, Tarantino has frequently considered resurrecting some of his characters and movies, from a Vega Brothers spin-off that has aged out of possibility, to Kill Bill 3, which would find the bride and her daughter tracked by some of the movie's survivors. Reservoir Dogs is certainly no exception, with Tarantino having flirted with turning it into a book, so far writing two chapters before shelving it to focus on the novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Tarantino recently stated, I, I actually considered about doing a remake of Reservoir Dogs as my last movie. I won't do it, Internet, all right? But I, I, I considered it. <laughs> oh well, he can tease his audience all he wants. We'll show up for whatever comes next, or last, as the case may be. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company, and we appreciate your support.